I'd like to call, call to order the Lawman Housing Authority Board of Commissioners meeting um, today, Tuesday, November 1st, 2020. No, this is it, right? January 31st, 2023. I was reading the minutes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, so can we have a roll call, please? I'll start on uh, Joe Peck, Chair. Uh, Aaron Rodriguez, I mean, Commissioner, along with Alan Horton. Marshall Martin, Commissioner. Sarah, any public safety? Harold Dominguez, Interim Executive Director. Eric Myers, Executive Director. Peter Dominguez, Academy Supervisor. Molly O'Donnell, Housing Director. Lisa Gallimar, Regional Manager. Tracy Francesco, Finance Manager. Uh, Sean McClay, Commissioner. Mm -hmm. Susie Zalba Faring, Commissioner. Mm -hmm. Peter Yambro, Commissioner. Thank you. Um, I don't think we need to get this one right. Do you want to see the attorney? Tim Wallace is the attorney. No, yes. Valerie Dodd. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Okay. okay, here. Valerie Dodd, next slide. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we are at agenda revisions and submissions of documents. I have a couple of motions that need to be made. I would like to a motion to. I would like to move to suspend by reference Council Rule Procedure 25.2.8.2 to allow for Commissioner Yarrow to participate remotely in this meeting. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? So that passes, passes unanimously. I move to allow electronic participation by Commissioner Yarbrough through January 31st, 2023. We're going to have to change that. Are you going to be back next Tuesday for the meeting? Okay. Yeah, um, I'll be back Tuesday. All right. Through January 31st, 2023, due to a personal matter that requires her to be out of state and unable to participate in person. Second. So if the move is seconded, uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That passes unanimously. Um, we need to uh, approve the November 1st, 2022 minutes. I have approval of the November 1st, 2022 minutes. Second. It's been moved by uh, Commissioner Rodriguez, seconded by Commissioner Hidalgo Barry. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? We are now at the public invited to be heard. We have three minutes. Is there anybody, anybody in the public that would like to participate? Nobody done it? So seeing no one, I'll close the public invited to be heard. And we are now at old and new business. Uh, resolution 2023-01, approve adoption of the 2023 utility allowance schedule. So that is, um, HUD requires that um, PHAs conduct the utility allowance, a reasonable utility allowance review every year. If the um, utilities don't go up at least 10 percent then we don't have to do a full survey we decided that this year that we would do a full survey um, and that's because of the utilities raise. so a survey was done in conjunction with Boulder County housing and human services and we, we did that as a partner to make sure that um, Boulder County Housing Authority and Boulder County um, Older housing partners all use the same utility allowance, and some of our clients are moving in. So we got the utility um, survey back, and um, it's gone up. Gas has gone up, electricity has gone down, um, and garbage has gone up. So it's, it's probably going to work out that the utility allowance that we get is a little bit higher. Than it was last year, but all in all, it's, it hasn't increased that much. Well, gas has. Gas has doubled mm -hmm. from last year. So we just need board approval to um, adopt the utility allowance for 2023. Can I ask um, what the survey shows? Oh, just an overall. Um, you know, they, what they did is they surveyed um, the city of Longmont. On utilities 
know, like, and then all of the, the services excel in, in Boulder. And what they found um, as a reasonable, in your packet, uh, is, uh, this, this form, and that's what they have found as far as being a reasonable cost. Per, and what they do is they have to look at the, the types of buildings, single family, um, multi family. And then if somebody is on oxygen, then we give an allowance for medical, um, extra medical, like an oxygen concentrator. Um, so what they look at is just what, um, what the rates were versus what the rates are now. And I haven't, this was done by Boulder County Housing and Human Services, and then we joined in with them. Yeah, I saw the rates, um, I was just curious as to um, how they compiled it. So, thank you for that. Can, can I send, do you want the survey? Are you interested in seeing the survey? Is it online? I can put it online. It's pretty big. It is. It is. <laughs> no, I'm fine. I trust you. So, in terms of the who, so obviously Excel, um, Walmart's different for all municipal, but you have Excel, you have United Power, you have the various trash services that are in play, and that's because the HCV vouchers, um, they move. And so we have people. BCPH vouchers that live in Longmont, people with uh, BHP vouchers living in Longmont. And so that's what makes sense for all of us to do. I think that sounds better. I guess that would be Yeah. So they, and they also look at propane and bottled gas. We don't run into that very often, but they look at that. Um, there's, a, there's a rain information gathering. We look at Western Disposable City of Longmont trash collection. Um, and they basically look at all of this and then just take an average usage for bedroom size. Okay, thank you. Can I have a motion to move Resolution 2023-01? So moved. Second. Okay, so uh, Resolution 2023-01 was moved by Commissioner Double Perry. Uh, duly seconded by Commissioner Burns, uh, McCoy, and mm -hmm. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed. So that passes unanimously. Next up is Re Resolution 2023-02, approved Senior Property Tax Exemption Partnership. So that's what we mean, Mother Donald, the Director. Um, so the Zinnia project is, is moving right along. This is the permanent support housing. We always remind them because the name has changed a couple of times. Um, next two suites. So we are still shooting for, well, still, we are currently shooting for a May financial closing on uh, the tax credits and financing. And in preparation for that, we're, there's a lot of moving pieces going on right now. Um, we recently processed the land transfer so that they have that in hand. And, and Continue funding the rest of their of their work, and before you tonight is the property tax exemption partnership that we would uh, request your approval on. Um, this is so that they can qualify for that property tax exemption by having the LHA as a special limited partner. And the calculation worksheet was attached to your board packet that shows what the value of the property tax is um, to them. Why this is such an attractive deal to developers. Uh, basically, it's the um, annual, I'm sorry, the 15 year compliance period. So that period where the tax credits uh, really have cover and um, hook onto that property. The value of the pro property tax is 989,000. So um, as a, we take a percentage um, of that as a fee based on the benefit to the community that the project is providing. And because this project is, is permanent support of housing and is going to serve 100% in people with incomes less than 30% of AMI, it qualifies for the lowest fee. Um, and it also qualifies, we don't really have an exact qualification language in our policy, but because it's a partner project with LHA, 
and because of those extraordinary benefits, um, it we recommend staff recommends that the five thousand dollar application fee be waived. Um, so therefore, the total fee for the developer would be forty nine thousand four hundred ninety seven thousand seventy four cents. Um, so that would be income to the LHA at closing, and then that tax benefit long term is what they would get in return. Um, so we recommend approval of this, but I would welcome any questions. How this works? In case you have any more questions. Uh, it's just too important to continue forward with this to slow it down. Mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, so why is the property tax exemption important for affordable housing? Uh, it really is because if you were to layer in the annual property tax to the operating costs associated with these units, it doesn't make it won't make financially affordable, and so that's why especially if permanent supported, you see it you'll see it up to sixty percent AMI in some communities that they pay a much larger fee based on that. And so you're really looking at it from a need based perspective. We are considering bringing back, there we go, about what, 20 minutes? Yeah. Um, I'll probably come and grab one of those after this item. Um, so we are considering some updates to this policy. You all voted to approve it back, thank you, back in February of last year, but we've learned a whole lot in a year and we're considering some tweaks uh, that this this one that you're considering tonight is basically going on the old policy but then anything coming forward after that we're gonna uh, present those new policy terms to you for consideration I move resolution 2023-02 so this resolution has been moved by um, Commissioner Rodriguez seconded by um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say that passes unanimously. Moving right along, we have resolution 2023-03, approval of intergovernmental agreement with City of Longmont for 2023 services. So, um, this is the annual IGA that we are putting forth for the the fiscal year 2023, so going back from January 1st to December 31st. Um, the Most of it is the same from last year. The only real difference is, well, only, we have several key differences. We're adding on public safety, health, and property management support services out of the public safety department with Sarah's help, which I think we're gonna have her chat a little bit more about that. And then we're adding the legal services since the city attorney's office is now our general counsel and helping us with um, you know, coordinate our, our special counsel needs too. Those are the key differences. And then we just updated the development work to be most accurate and the latest status on each of those. You all re recall um, as city council in the budget conversations, um, we put funding in from the general fund and from the uh, housing authority to cover the legal expenses of the in-house council based on the volume of work um, and so Tim is is going to be the in-house counsel on this and, um, and so all the work in terms of the housing community investment work, the affordable housing, um, everything coming in under affordable housing will work with Tim in addition to all the housing community and uh, we still will probably have to contract some evictions out initially until um, Tim gets his feet under and hopefully it slows down. But I um, fully expect within a lot of years to be able to handle most of it. And then Sarah, talk a little bit about Sarah's. As you all know, we have been um, utilizing Sarah's services for quite some time. Actually, probably from the beginning when we took over the housing authority based on the uh, number of issues we were having in properties. And um, what we found is that it's an incredibly important partnership with public safety that's been there um, uh, throughout this. Uh, started really feeling that we were impacting public safety because I think Sarah was spending I mean, certainly a lot of her time on our work. And so we funded it at 
a level two or level one officer. Level one. Level one. Okay, level one officer. We actually did it based off of her okay. salary at 50%. But it's equivalent to an entry level officer so that uh, that money is going to be transferred to the police department so that they can utilize it to augment her services as she's working with us. And um, Zach has reviewed in terms of some of his structuring issues and how they're going to program those dollars to be used. But Sarah will still work for Zach, uh, but spend a lot of time with me and the, the LHA team. Uh, and she'll talk a little bit about what she does, but it's really liaisoning with Corey Lee on the health and safety functions. We've added liaisoning with the fire department as we're trying to do um, educational sessions and properties. Um, also bridging the gap for support services that are beyond kind of what we have access to, that they have access to via um, public safety for the residents. And, um, and we're probably going to keep adding stuff. Uh, she's now taking over some of the our actively involved in the network that we're dealing with, and I'll talk about that in the Good. Good. So even though you're augmenting it financially, is that losing a body? No, they have the ability to have an entry-level officer with the money we put in. Okay. We didn't hit all of the, we didn't have the full loaded cost, we weren't able to hit it this year, but He's working through that, but he's also working through operational changes that he's looking at where they may choose to use the dollars in a different way, but it's still augmenting the operations of the police department. Okay. So do we have any other comments or discussions saying no, can I have a motion for the resolu resolution 202303? Resolution 202303. Second. So that will be moved uh, by Commissioner the Double Ferry and second by Commissioner Rodriguez. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Yes, this unanimous then. So we get to take the 2022 bank debt. I don't I don't know who that <laughs> <laughs> So we gave you a summarized what it looks per property. Um, what that accounts to is we wrote off about um, 19 individuals that were below three dollars, most of them were in between actually like one and two dollars. Um, there were four that were between 200 to 500 dollars, um, three that were below a thousand, and then one that was below five thousand. The larger one was done because um, that they actually found after the individual moved out, saw her obituary actually in the paper, documented it on the property, so. There's no reason to send it to collections. Um, confirmed it with Sarah. <laughs> and um, so that's that was the biggest. Um, Carol has a found in our debt, bad debt policy that we're not going to make by that so for tenant or the loan. Anything above that would come to you guys for approval. Um, but that's where we are kind of stand at. We're kind of looking at a standard of about writing off anything that's under a thousand, mm -hmm. anything that's over try to attempt collections and see where that goes. And, and, the well, and the collections process is getting more complicated uh, because unless there's a court order judgment, collections can't go after some of the thing. Well, they, they, can't, they can't go to a collection agency. So we actually thought, like, you know, we weren't doing our due diligence to get these to the collection agency so that not only are we aware when they come back to us to rent again and we don't have it um, in our system anymore that it's, it's recorded somewhere mm -hmm. but according to the collection agency it's laws of just they don't take anything they won't take um, fees so if it's literally which is what our balance is it's all fees mm -hmm. <laughs> um, back to the, to, to the individual they won't put it unless you do a judgment and you follow through on that judgment so um, that's where we'll probably see maybe some of the meth limits yeah and part of it's interesting it's um i'm hearing from other property owners that rent property it is becoming a bit of a challenge for folks because people are literally not paying rent and then they're accruing fees but then they're paying rent and so they're ending up with 
thousands and thousands of dollars of fees, but there's no mechanism to get it. And so it's it's something that um, I think housing authorities and, and private um, landlords are facing right now with this, which is also connected to why when we when we deal with issues, it's why you have to go through the formal eviction process and actually get the eviction of the judgments because only until you do that can you collect it. So we've had some eviction, one of the evictions that was I think our highest met number, um, we got the judgment and they said that any, anything that was associated with that, we could recover. And so that would be one that would go into this process. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I was just gonna ask, do you official acceptance of the report or? That'd be great. Okay. Um, so can I have a motion to approve the annual report for the 2022 bad debt write-off? So moved. Second. So that's been moved by Commissioner um, Martin, seconded by Commissioner Zabella Ferry. Before we go, I mean before we go, we're not going um, When did that change that the fee versus the you know, when I called the collection agency, that's just what they did. They said that the collection agency is what? If it's rent, is he actually at rent due, then they can actually submit that. Um, and the collection agency will take that. But if it's fee driven, they don't need to submit it. Probably more business practices than legislative. Pro pro yeah, or I don't know. We were thinking maybe some legislative touch on this one because, but. We stepped into it because we're like, well, we need to collect money, and we don't know when it changed. They just said we can't take it. So we've got some work to do to figure that out. I mean, they can take it, but they it can't really go to litigation. So so they'll take it. So anything over a thousand, they'll take, and they'll try to collect for us. But they also do kind of a determination on um, whether it goes to litigation. Can this person pay? And they won't take it to the litigation unless they can determine that this person can pay, which we're in a low income housing sector. So, you know, a lot of that's probably never going to go to litigation. Um, litigation, they'll pay the upfront costs, but then they get paid back first before we would see any of the, that, that money come back. So it's. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So the move to the second is so to approve the uh, annual report. All those in favor? Say aye. 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 All those opposed? Did you have a question? Oh, I'm sorry. Commissioner Yarbrough. Well, thank you, uh, Ms. Chair. Commissioner. <laughs> 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 Um, so did I hear right that there isn't a system that can seek the information of the charges or collections, um, at least within the county, where we can recognize when uh, a tenant has an, uh, have charges within our LAJ or within um, another housing facility, you know, another housing area. Although I know that if we don't, if we're not able to, you know, get charges against them, uh, go to court with that. Um, if we had a system that syncs, at least within Boulder County with all the apartments and with the uh, Boulder Housing Authority, even if it was just between Boulder Housing Authority and us, um, that would be great so that we can know who owes what and those, you know, because we know how some tenants can be before we get ready to charge them, they're hopping into another uh, unit in a different city. And so once they get approved over there, we haven't even pressed charges against them yet. Um, we don't even know they moved out yet. So here they are in a whole nother apartment in another city. Um, so those are some of the challenges. I know how that happens, but is there any way or is there a system that can seek that information, especially regarding to uh, charges within the housing board? So there is not anything out there. I know Sarah and I talked to some attorneys about the legalities of doing this. This is where it basically comes down to the landlord's due diligence of doing the landlord check prior to that person moving in. 
I'm checking with the previous landlord or current landlord to see <coughs> open and pending. So, so it certainly doesn't end up on a background check. Yeah. And then the well, credit agencies. Well, then that gets into some of the fair housing laws in terms of what you can and you can't consider. So even if you had the system, it would, we would have to figure out how that would, would fall into it. And, and part of the challenge, what, we, what we've been saying, so when you have an issue that warrants eviction, is why you also go through the eviction process because we don't want to have well, she's mad because I, that's probably the worst thing for sure. um, what we call three day notice. You go through the process because that then becomes available for other landlords to see. I think where you run into issues is when people don't go through the eviction process, and that's to your point where now all of a sudden, every, you can find, I think Sarah can talk to this, that multiple properties have had the same issue with the same person because no one's ever gone through the eviction process and still under fair housing there's nothing that you can really use and that's why we're pretty focused on that piece but we've been trying we've asked lisa to talk to during the boulder apartment association or try to talk to them about those types of issues because what's happening is we're just all experiencing the same issues with a lot of the same people. You know, fortunate part is that the eviction process is expensive because yeah. staff have to go to court and um, all the filing and record keeping. And I mean, it's necessary, but it is still very expensive on um, LHA. Yeah. Well, and also now because the mediation system that the courts have put in place, we're seeing less evictions being actually founded so that's another piece to this we could go to eviction court and it not end up as an eviction so that's another whole other topic but that's happening too are there any comments i just thought of this so it didn't miss me okay but we, we, the city, often work to help our residents avoid eviction before mm -hmm. eviction proceedings. Um, are we creating a conflict with ourselves there by doing so? So we have to be really careful in terms of the lines where we're, we're sitting and who's doing what. Uh, what I can tell you is from our perspective, eviction is absolutely the last thing that we want to do. And so we had, I mean, you know, we had one recently where um, the issue was not in the range of significance, not like the most significant issues that you all have heard about. Um, but the situation is, so we go in, we talk, can't continue doing this, you need to stop because it's impacting the other residents. We back up, we watch. We do it again, then we go with another warning, but it's an official warning and it's a letter that says, you were warning. And on that one, we went in with a 10 day notice to, to, to stop the behavior. And then it continued. And then we went in with, we're going to eviction. Now what we're finding is that a lot of times when when people hit that point, it is not uncommon that they have not communicated to their caregivers or other people until they get to eviction. And a lot of the less severe issues that we find is then sons, daughters, relatives, whatever, will jump in and try to help manage. And then we're still willing, even at that point, to do a mediated agreement that says, here's what you need to do. And if you keep doing this, then we reserve our right to take you back in through the eviction process. So we have like four or five steps that we go through. So by the time we're getting that point, we've done almost everything that we can. And in some cases, that's where Sarah and Lisa are talking about the other services and other providers that we can get in. If they're associated with um, MHP, we're talking to MHP and other groups to go in. So it is 
a lengthy process that we're going through to get to this point. And normally by the time, I don't think we've had one where we've lost the mediation. And the reason, or had, had it not awarded, I think the reason is, is because we're going through all these processes on the front end to, to avoid getting to eviction. Yeah. That is, that is completely right. And there's a lot of times we will ask Susan Spalding and her group of mediators to step in way before or even to that eviction to try to work out and problem solve together to help keep those residents housed. In the absence of that, I think Susan does a really good job of removing herself but as the direct mediator for certain um, residents, specifically LHA, if it's a conflict. Thank you. So I hope that gave you everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. Let's vote on this. Um, oh, I didn't think we did it because I called them. Well, we voted on it and then it took more. Yep. I'm so glad you're here. I understand. Thank you. So we're at the community manager decision and issue escalation with makers. After we do the 2020 to do the So I'm going to kick this off for Molly. So Molly's going to do this. The one thing as you look at the goal issue um, that uh, I would ask you all to think about is so you, you've heard part of what we've talked about in terms of how we move through the evictions and the living process. Um, that's only a piece of the broader tenant issues that we're dealing with. Um, and then on top of that, when you look at the financial world and what's going on, um, it seems like we're in constant audits and inspections, either from governmental agencies or investors. Um, and then you'll hear me talk a little bit later in, in the um, executive director reports about then how we deal with snow. Um, and, and so when you look at the goal document, and, and you know what I would say is when you look at the staff because this is pretty much it um, we're trying to do that and trying and the daily operations so I just say if you could keep that in perspective because you know, you know for a while we lost three songs every Friday when she was in court mm -hmm. and um, and so that's just kind of that's what we're working through and the goals are important to that because as we talk about development, development's also about revenue. And the revenue allows you to hire more staff. Uh, and so, Molly, do you want to? So you have a pretty comprehensive document in your packet. Um, it does list out all the goals that were adopted also last, I think it was actually last March. Um, so we just thought it would be good maybe once a year or however often requested, but at least preemptively um, to go over kind of what we accomplished in 2022 relative to those goals and specifically the action items um, and then what we have targeted for 2023 focus areas so i'm not going to go through everything it's a lot um, but i might just go over kind of a, some of the key accomplishments in each goal area um, so the first one ensuring that lha residents and properties are safe and welcoming using healthy and inclusive communication processes this is really a, a process um, piece on staff side and so we've uh, made sure that resident quality of life is a standing agenda item of the advisory board and make sure we're um, doing uh, quality of life add-ons at the properties as much as possible we were able to increase budgets for that this for 2023 um, we are hitting this where we came, but you can see that there's still work to be done here. Well, and thank you all and your role as council for funding the uh, transit. Um, that was a big part of quality of life that we didn't have the funding for within the housing authority, but as council, you all used your contingency for that and um, really successful program. We're using it and, and uh, we're getting good reports, maybe augmenting a little bit this year based on what we're learning. The second goal is really around that um, using the housing needs assessment that the city is is doing um, and trying to have that help guide our development at LHA. So we did have accomplishments there. It was slower than anticipated because of uh, procurement struggles with how many communities out there are trying to do the exact same thing right now and only so many firms. 
But um, that did kick off. We're they're in the group policy research is the firm that we contracted with, and they're in the data uh, gathering session or uh, section of the project, and they'll be doing engagement here soon. And then we will have some uh, draft numbers to look at later in the spring, and then hope to finalize that report in May. So that we can use in our development efforts to make sure we're hitting the right um, gaps in the community. Um, and then, will that be available to us in May? Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll do a presentation to approve the council. Number three, increase access to rental assistance. This is really around our voucher program. Mm -hmm. um, so the main goal was we were looking for opportunities to expand our voucher program. Um, tap into new resources, expand our authority as much as we can. We continually research those um, notices of funding availability, the NOFAs, and we came and presented to you once about just a sampling of, of what we had been looking at and why in those cases it didn't work for LHA, but we're still on the lookout constantly. Um, and we are doing a lot of work around the voucher program regarding compliance, make sure everything's up to speed, all of our people are being treated equitably, um, got our administrative plan updated in 2022, which was many years out of date, um, and that will really guide a lot of our policies going forward too. One of the things we may bring you on this, and it will bring it to you in two forms, one is, is your role as commissioners, but also as your role as city council, is uh, a blanket resolution that gives me the ability to apply for grants, um, because sometimes you run into certain grants that need approvals, and by the time you look at timelines, Mess. And so we may, for affordable and attainable housing, both as the affordable for the commissioners, affordable and attainable as the council asks for a resolution that gives me that authority to apply for these grants. That's a good idea. Yeah, you weren't on that meeting this morning. <laughs> Um, there's still a lot of work that we'd like to do in 2023 to continue to expand that program. We really do feel like it's at that stabilized point and we're ready to grow. And we've been talking to the, our partners at PHP and BCHA about this too, that we try and coordinate and figure out um, just what works best. Um, number four is development. <clears throat> so this is the, the heftiest one, especially for 2022. There's so much development activity going on because it's really tied to the time constraints with the ARPA funding that's attached to most of these projects. So um, there's a lot of activity that's happened and will continue to happen for the next couple of years while we um, make sure that funding gets utilized. So you will see this is probably our biggest focus area in terms of the sheer volume of stuff <laughs> that has, has been happening. Um, so I will just not go through every project. I'll let you ask anything specific if you want, or we'll solve anything. Can I ask a question about those ARPA funds based upon what I told you that comes to reduce token? Yeah, so um, Sandy's been in discussions with me, and I think um, what folks are hearing is that um, as you look at the debt ceiling question, mm -hmm. there may be some conversations about ARPA funds that aren't expended as being a negotiating tool um, and, and using that to give capacity for the, the debt ceiling issue. Um, so we're sending them information because the challenge is for communities like Longmont, you know, we put $8 million out of the 11.9 that we had in ARPA all to housing and we plan to augment that with three million dollars out of the affordable housing fund that the projects we're talking about. The challenge with that is it takes time okay. to, to get through these processes. So we're communicating that earmark and that allocation and, and the fact that we're doing it. We're also evaluating um, how we, we spend the money in more quickly in, in certain projects but there are a lot of landmines that you get into in terms of when you buy the land and when you convey it. Uh, you'll see on one project, the one on Culver, um, we spend a lot of 
you can spend like two or three weeks trying to figure <coughs> out because on that project, but prior to the, the us becoming involved with the housing authority many, many years ago, um, LHTC purchased that land adjacent to the Lodge and Arsenal. But they have a loan from the affordable housing. And so we're having to figure out how do we thread the needle um, with the ARPA funds, looking at the loan, and not creating issues in terms of the development of the project. Because if you miss one step in there, you can bog the project down completely. And, and so we're communicating all of these issues. On that one, we actually got a good answer, I think, that said recently, um, buy Go now. Go now. <laughs> and so some of those dollars are going to be moving now. Oh, cool. Um, but yeah, you don't want to jeopardize the actual development yeah. of it by just misstepping. And to give you a sense, the missteps, why the development is so complicated is the missteps start at the beginning and go to the day of closing. If you literally file a document incorrectly, it messes up the waterfall. And so what we learned is even in terms of the city's process, our process was you move stuff through and you file it and they record it. Yeah, that's a mess. And so you let the title companies figure out all the recording and how to do it. So even now, things we would normally record as the city, we're not doing that. We're letting the title companies tell us what to do. So there's a couple more. Would you like to keep going or did you? Okay. So goal number five is preservation. So this is really about our recentification process uh, for a couple of our projects that are on the horizon. So Village Place is going in full force. Um, that is on track to close at the end of this year. Where we have an architect, we're selecting a uh, construction contractor right now. It's moving quickly. Um, and then the other two that we've had on here, we've learned some things in the last year. Um, Chapa is not really keen on resyndicating right at that 15 year um, compliance period end mark, unless you have a pretty extraordinary circumstance. So we're making that case for Village Place because it didn't have a full rehab the last go around. Um, but for Aspen Meadows and Hearthstone and Lodge, with, with this may end up pushing out the schedule a bit if we can't um, get through Chapa. As we were so. The city has slash will have um, building efficiency goals that are really important to the overall um, city sustainability mm -hmm. strategy. Are those going to be um, uh, part of the justification for the syndication of these buildings? Because they're probably not tight enough to meet the need. Um, I think we're, we're, what Chap is really saying in re-syndication is so the model was for years and years and years, every 15 years people would come in and re-syndicate. And what that, what that ultimately did is um, reduce the amount of new projects that they could come in because they have a limited pool of funds in terms of that world. And so why they're saying we don't want to re-syndicate on the 15-year mark is I think they're managing their financial portfolio. And, and the only reason we think we can get Village Place in is because when the Housing Authority purchased it from the private developer, they used the tax credits to purchase the property, but they didn't make any improvements to the property. They're not they just did, yeah, critical systems, nothing yeah, not, aesthetic. Not, and so the property as it sits today looks like it did when it was constructed originally. So the argument we're making to them is this property is, is due for capital improvements in this. Um, I'm not sure how much attention they'll pay to to ask to be some village place, but what I can tell you on new construction is that's a component of the tax credit process and sustainability issues. And so we are looking at it on the new construction. 
So on Village Place, we are required to meet Enterprise Green Communities building standards, which all um, tax credit properties do. And then we there's solar panels up there that are as part of the water system, the water heat system. We are working with LPC to assess whether those can be uh, re re basically used again. They're not in use at the moment. Mm -hmm. And we're working with LPC just to look for other funding opportunities or anything to do more upgrades than the, the standards set by the communities. So there will be some. We're working with LPC. Yeah, I'm, I'm much more concerned about, about consumption of fuels and and the you know, comfort level of the buildings and things like that. But I, I mean, of, of course it has to be justifiable through the processes, but um, I hope that we'll be, I guess what I'm saying is that I hope that we will start with a full complement of asks um, based on our local sustainability goals. Mm -hmm. That is the plan. Um, okay. We're our our asks right now are for everything, including sustainability items and the upgrades that we want to do. We're at the we're at the full request level right now, and we're going to have to work our way down as we determine the budget and the pricing. Um, but we, that is fully on the list at this time to do whatever we can manage. So, Carol, does that include, or Marty, does that include? Um, your desire, I guess, to make uh, the new Hover LNG development um, sustainable, renewable, uh, as as a pro as a pilot project, almost to see what you can yeah. put in. Yeah, that's why I said new construction is a little bit easier. You yeah, know, when you come in. To so you go in and you go, here's how much money we want. Now they have limits already set up. So there's like a hard limit mm -hmm. where it's not an unlimited pool of funds that you can, you can get because when you're working through this, you're looking at, and Molly, help me on this, you're looking at rent structures and everything else to see what the cash flow is going to be. So that's one of the things when we look at Village Place is having to look at it because of historically what they've done and the number of people we have that aren't at the right income levels. And so you have cash flow limitations that really get into the debt. And so what's the limit that you can ask for under your chapter? Um, per, <coughs> per unit cost limit? Yeah. We're, for Village Place, we're shooting for 90000 per unit, which is pretty high. I yeah. don't know what the exact top limit is, but mm -hmm. it varies depending on the project. Yeah. And so you get into those conversations with them in terms of what is, what is it per unit. Um, we are having conversations on the Hover uh, property. I had a few today, um, and we had a city manager meeting with John Cotter and Tower and how they can come in and help with some of these issues because uh, the scale is a little bit larger on those units. And so we're looking at different mechanisms to do it. Okay. Moving on, number six, uh, this is partnership with service providers, and this is where uh, we really have a good amount of work to, to start focusing on in 2023. And uh, we did um, work with VIA, we got the VIA service set up. Um, we really have set a really good relationship, tone for a relationship with the residents at Coffee and Conversations and coming up with ideas together for what services that they would like added um, and how to how to accommodate them budget-wise. Um, we are working with Next Light on bulk agreements for low-income residents. Valerie's here, and that's mm -hmm. on my list to talk to you again about again here soon. Um, and really, but we do have more we want to do. Um, but it's more about building those partnerships and takes some time. Number seven. Oh, thank you. Oh, sorry. So, uh, what's a carry-up program? Uh, I'm sorry, which number was that? I just saw that. Number five under number six. Cultivate. So this was something that Karen Roney, that was one of her 
special projects we wanted to get started. We haven't gotten started with this yet, but is carry out services cultivate related to um, food distribution? I believe that's the grocery pickup system where the, they go do the shopping for the residents. It's kind of like Kroger pickup or something like that, but they, it, here towards seniors, they place it through their app, they go pick up it, and then carry out the groceries to them. And we're doing the grocery trips with VIA for now as well, so this is more for those who can't get out, um, have limited mobility, need stuff outside of our trips. Uh, number seven, partnerships for assisted living units. This is one that we really did start with pretty uh, in full force in 2022, just to figure out what direction we should even look towards. Um, and we did a lot, we had a lot of great progress on doing that and figuring out what does a Medicaid structure look like? What um, does the service provision look like compared to like managing a property? Who who does what and how does it fit together? And on the financing side, um, we happened to meet with a developer who's done this before in Illinois quite a bit, and they've worked with NDC, and NDC has a lot of experience doing assisted living. So we've done a lot of research on this one. Um, really, from a capacity standpoint, this is a big project. Even if we don't necessarily get in on the service side, even if we're um, just investing in the project in exchange for a um, a um, preference list on their acceptance for our residents. That's what we hope to trade off for investment. But even with that, it is just a big, it's a big one. So for staff capacity reasons, we have Zinnia, Hover, Village Place, Christmas Christ 2 going right now. So it's just, we've gotten at least our, our concept out there and then we're gonna how that thing's settled. Well, and, and we're working on the development of the, not part of the OJ, but we did move the, the funds into Molly's report where we're not going to report on uh, the ability to create a for sale and for a payable product. That shifted out of the LHJ going over to the city because we do rental, the city does for sale. Mm -hmm. It's the same people <laughs> that it's doing it now. So when they look at those six projects, Mm -hmm. All right, so yeah, the one thing I will tell you on the affordable assisted living is I think what's pretty fair is we don't need a good service provider. If anything, we, we may talk about management of the facilities, but that is so specialized that you need a partner that understands how to run it and operate it. And uh, I think once we get a little further down on these other projects, they're willing to engage with us. Uh, number eight, this is um, established partnerships for early childhood education programs. So you'll see not a lot of uh, progress on this in 2022, mm -hmm. but what we've done just even since the beginning of 2023 in the last month is we've really dove in head first on early childhood and that possibility at Hover that we're going to talk about later tonight. Mm -hmm. Um, so things are starting to move already with that, um, but there's still more to be done, including trying to serve uh, our existing residents, not just the new development. So, and then finally, homeownership pathways and opportunities. Um, we really have not delved into this fully, um, but if we have an opportunity with for sale affordable housing for the city coming up, we can definitely find ways to create a link to try and help those who are ready to go. Well, I just said a slightly difficult concept of that the city is not going to carry things for a sale. Mm -hmm. It's going to be some sort of developer yeah, I think partnership. The, yeah, I think the challenge in the for sale is there, so remember we're dealing with affordable individuals who fall under the affordable range. It's hard to get something going now because there's not affordable stock in the community for sale. Mm -hmm. I think as we talk about what we're trying to do on the city side, and you see opportunities to create for sale units, there, there will be a trigger point where we will want to start communicating with our voucher holders and right now only asking that neighborhood because it's really the only family housing that we have. 
and try to try to figure out how do we get people in programs that exist to get them ready to to buy a house. But it wouldn't violate equal housing if no, it can't be a direct pipeline. It's not a direct that's pipeline. pipeline. That's no, that's you're just means. getting them ready and qualified. Uh -huh. if it, a direct pipeline would violate a equal housing. Yeah. That's what I thought. Just curious about that. I think the big thing that we really what you see in this is just the, the volume of work that's really eating up everyone's lunch right now is in the development side. And uh, I think I said before, we finished Christmas in what, nine months? What months? Well, it's probably average just getting through the finances. Um, Zinnia appears to move faster, but we were working on it yes. for years ahead of this. And so um, the financing piece of this, at, at its quickest, is one month. I would think probably realistically 16 months. Mm -hmm. um, for all of the steps that you have to go through. And then in a lot of cases, we've been really lucky in that our first run in tax credits, we've got the tax credits. It's not uncommon in the tax credit world to fail your first run. Mm -hmm. And so um, if you fail on your first event, then you're talking 24 months to get through all of those pieces. Which didn't happen to me yet. Oh, that's right. We did fail the first time. So yeah, it's only a list of those 24 months. So now we are at the uh, community manager decision and issue escalation. So I'll leave this one off. So I know um, Commissioner Waters was asking about this. Um, mm -hmm. It's a little bit different here because what we had to do was really go in and, and look at the policies that were in place for the housing authority and. And then what we realized is the policies were not updated, they, they weren't, you name it, we were seeing issues all over. Because of the world that we're in with the audits and with HUD, you have to start with the policies. And so they have, Tracy and the team have been working diligently and they've got our operating policies, the draft form ready, which is, then we took the draft form of the operating policies and put it into this matrix for you all to see in terms of who does what, what are the triggers, and, and how things get escalated. This is really helpful. Mm -hmm. So this is, hope, the hope is for community managers and, we, and for maintenance technicians as well um, to have this kind of as a quick reference guide, but have the full manual to tie to uh, to pull up all the details on all of these and use on an offline basis. And then the other piece that we struggled with is so when we took over, um, there was nothing in a white paper form that gave you like an executive summary of what to do. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to try to then add components there on things that we're running into, documenting them and putting them in place where you have the policies, but sometimes it's hard to make sense of what. And, and really having this is your high level guideline on some things, a white paper below it, and then your policies as a backup. Because we're finding that there's just nuances that the policy lets us deal with it, but we're learning through how we can deal with it. It's the how that we have to capture. That's not front and center for us right now. It's not front and center for us right now. I'm just making it up To me, it's really operational. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Project based voucher request proposals. That is me. So, that allows the PHA to set aside 20% of their voucher allocation to project base so it's not it's not extra um, funding we just take our vouchers our current vouchers 
and put them into a project. So they are the, the client would have to move into the project in order to get assistance. And so right now the LHA has project based um, eighty of its hundred and three allowed um, vouchers. So the Suites has forty. Christmas one has ten. Aspen Meadows neighborhood has twelve. Briarwood has three, and then Aspen Meadows um, or Fall River has fifteen. So that's thirty. So um, we have right now twenty three that we can project base. And when you when you start looking at project base, you start looking at um, the the approach that you take is to look at what is happening in the local market. Um, if voucher clients are having problems finding a place because of the rents are too high, you look at existing, uh, you look at the PHA policy to see if we can, you know, um, project base up to 20%, and that's already been approved. We also look at the types of households and preferences that, that are currently in um, health. Project-based vouchers and LIHTC, so we usually take LIHTC properties because the LIHTC rents are usually typically higher than what a person at 30% of their income would be able to pay. So with that, um, we, we had talked about preserving um, existing affordable housing. And since we have the 23, and we're thinking that 20 of you are project based, another 20, um, we would have to go out for an RFP um, for project submittals to, to find a site to um, project base the, the vouchers to. We can, we can do a couple things. We can limit it to preserving existing housing, and that's what we decided to do. So it would have to be existing housing that we're trying to preserve as affordable, and we are limiting it, limiting it to elderly projects that are resyndicated um, through RISA. So, for example, a village place could apply for them, if they have a cash flow problem and they need the vouchers to to um, get higher rents, then um, it could be a gap funding source. So that RFP is to us not ready, um, and we'll go out and the process is is we'll get some um, we'll have a review team that will review it and come back with a suggestion on what projects would be the best project based the, the vouchers in. Um, Jaffe has to do conduct a subsidy layering review once that is done and the, the um, project is selected and approved, then it will come to the board for approval. And it's just an informational so we're, I'm going to tack on, we're operating within the admin plan, which allows us, this sets the procedure procedure for going ahead and doing a request for proposals to, to see what developments out there are the future. What's the word you used? The, the something plan? The administrative plan. Administrative. Yes. So we uh, ran the administrative plan updates through your board a couple of months ago, in November. Um, and so it's all up to date. And it is typical for administrative plans to set out these um, procedures for putting out requests for proposals for, for the use of project-based vouchers. Um, what's unique is usually housing authorities can put them out and if they aren't um, developing as robustly, then you want all of the competition from the community to see what else is out there. In this case, it's we're in a very unique time where ARPA funding for that is going to public agencies is supporting some of these projects that are on time limits and are really need they're all of them need gap funding to move forward and meet those time limits. So 
we're, we have a couple instances where we are putting out for competitive proposals knowing that some LHA properties are dependent on gap funding as well. And so we expect Village Place to, to put in for it. And this is the standard process. This is exactly what was done for Fall River back in 2018. Um, and putting specific um, evaluation factors in is also standard process for those. So why it's why we think it's pretty critical for preservation is that a lot of the times preservation projects that don't have other options. Uh, they don't have the same funding opportunities that new builds have. Project-based vouchers are sometimes the only thing that is gonna make them work. And so um, we thought that that was a reasonable evaluation criteria for this one. And really it's, it's a project readiness issue too because to put out project-based vouchers Anybody else that comes in with a proposal that we would consider are, um, I have to be ready to go, pretty much. So we will, we do have authority from HUD to issue 43 project-based vouchers, which we say we're in 23 and we're ready. We're just gonna take it a piece at a time, do 20 now, but that does mean that once we uh, figure out our budget authority, because really we're, we're not adding anything, it's just swapping um, one voucher program for another, that we'd be ready to put out those 23 and we can put out different criteria. We can put out you know, family units to try and get maximize the number of people housed. We could we can change the criteria to put a lot and put those out each time. Yeah, no. remember when I say we're constantly learning something. Mm -hmm. The housing authority process that most use doesn't sense to me and so we're looking at all alternatives to this because you have to put it out for RFP even if you're submitting your own project yeah. and so we're we're going to work with Tim and others to try to figure out how to move through this um, as we look to the future because um, I told Molly it would make more sense to if we had a plan, we have to figure out where we can do it. So if we're developing, then they can go to those projects. And if you're not developing, then you can do this. But it's, it's, a, it's a unique thing that we're having to work for. Because you will see an RFP of which we are submitting a project. And if the, if the housing authority was the owner, we wouldn't have to do that. Right. So um, it, it depends on a lot of things. Yeah. And so really this is also a point in time awkwardness um, because at some point later in time if we grow our voucher program and have excess to put out, we do want to bring in other developments in the community as well. But because of the, the funding amounts out there right now and the number of volume of projects going for internal and um, you know, maybe that the procedure was written at a time where things really looked different, where they were really trying to yeah. bring in outside developers. So, and, and I want to kind of give you a project based voucher are very important to projects, especially at the lower AMI rates. Because when you do your, your financial modeling, kind of what we were talking about before, what can we get, what we can do. When you're in those lower AMIs, they almost inherently come back with a gap. Mm -hmm. Project-based vouchers fills a gap because it's guaranteed income that's coming from the voucher holder into the project, and you're not necessarily dependent on rental income coming into it. And so that's what fills the gap in the portfolio, which is when you see Zinio is a lot where we have to put them in, because if we weren't, if we didn't put project based options into that one, it would have been financial. So, talk about learning curves. I'm having a little trouble with the project based voucher. Um, I understand vouchers go to a person to find housing. A housing choice vouchers do. Yeah, okay. So, when you have a project based voucher, does that allow? So, so you're going to have Xenia, so you're going to get project-based vouchers to help build Xenia, basically. Yeah, the easy way to think about it is housing choice vouchers are what keep 
Yes. Project based vouchers are with units. Okay. So it always stays with the unit, uh, and yeah. you just have to make sure you're bringing people at the end of the right AMI for that for project. The, oh, okay, so yeah. just think units, people, and just get the control. Right. So, so you can kind of like a rig control on that unit? Uh, sorry. Most of our units are controlled in some way anyway for yeah. that tech. There's been porting. Yeah. Yeah. You, you cannot port a project. That was actually easy. Yes. So there's a, there's Thank benefits you. to both. Housing choices, the, the point is people can go out in the community and we can spread yeah. out low incomes, not concentrate. With project based, you think, well, that's concentrating, but it actually is a way to get a unit and a household housed. Um, and it's very valuable to developers because of the guaranteed rents that come with it. And after a year, a, t a resident that's in a project based, can request a voucher. Okay. And if they have availability, they, yeah, yes. they can get a voucher and move out. Yeah. And so your rent control question, when you when you set your tax credit project, so for example, at Christmas we came in and said there's going to be X 60% AMI units, X 50, X 40, X 30. Those units then stay with that AMI and then we get a report on an annual basis that says, here's what we were allowed to charge in that AMI range. And so it doesn't hold it at what it is, but we're regulated by the state in terms of what that rental charge would be. Is that correct, Kendall? Yes, and, and, but you also get to go up to the fair market rent right. on those units as well. So even though it has an AMI, on. we on project-based vouchers, <laughs> so on project-based vouchers, you then go up to the fair market rent, which means we're getting via the voucher the fair market rent, but the person is still at that A and R rate. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, cause you got down that right yeah. <laughs> So, can I just ask you a So, when you want to spread this project based voucher system out to the, for example, if Ryan Bear is building more and you want him to have different, uh, lower AMI, people do, does he get to use project based vouchers on some of his units? And they will always stay at that AMR because it stays with the developer if it doesn't move with the if they meet the requirements of the RFP. So in this case our RFP is saying maintaining existing housing for older adults. So you would have to meet those base requirements to apply for it. Okay. And there's actually a pretty hefty list of, of just general requirements, not necessarily the evaluation that most developers wouldn't do unless they were specific affordable housing developers. So I couldn't imagine somebody trying to go for project-based vouchers to, to help, well, they couldn't for their inclusionary housing requirement. Okay, thanks for that. Which is pretty specific <laughs> niche. You don't really see market rates going for vouchers. Kind of needs to know. It's a compliance world, but not really. Do we have any more discussion on that? It's a very interesting subject though. It's it's complex. And this is this just the, the FYI that we are following the procedure in our advent plan of doing this. It will come to you for final consideration of what project gets awarded. So that'll come back to you. So we are now at the Hobo Land Development Community Service Programs. So Dallas is going to share a figure here. Okay. So, uh, the Hover Land, so this is that um, pair of parcels that are adjacent to Hearthstone and Lodge, right here on this side. Um, this is land owned by LHDC, which we've talked about we're going to use the ARPA funds to allow LHA to purchase it from LHDC. They pay back the city from their loan. It's like, keep the money in. That's a whole financing thing. but. Really, what we've done is in December we selected a development partner, um, and they have started in full force putting together concept plans for what we could do with the site. So the several things that we told them we were interested in pursuing are um, 
prefab homes, if possible, at least exploring it to the point where we try and decide if it's feasible financially and amongst other factors or not. So let me, but, jump, let me yeah. jump in on that one. So when we went to, to visit um, Indiewell, mm -hmm. we put that in the RFP. We're not moving away from it, we're still looking at it, but it, that product is posing some interesting issues in the tax credit side because the lenders don't know how to quite deal with it. And and on the other side of it, they need all the money up front. So while it may be cheaper to actually construct the unit, it may be more expensive based on the interest and everything else that's going into it versus in a traditional construction process when you go in and you pay them, you're paying bills as they're coming in. Mm -hmm. This you have to front a ton of money into it. So we're trying to understand that piece. Uh, we're still looking at it, our nurse we're looking at it, but it's a it's a unique twist on the money side of it. Mm -hmm. Well I know that part of the governor's big push was was, was prefab as well. So mm -hmm. was wondering if that ties in at all to the I think it could. I think the it might help. The, it, the issue is really on the fabrication side and how how are their models set up? Because if they're requiring you to come in and fund forty percent of it up front in the normal construction, you're, you know, they're fronting that cost and then you're paying bills every thirty days. It's expensive, but you're not coming in with forty percent of the dollar up front. And that's what we're trying to understand their models a little bit. The other side of it is um, you have to have the right contractor. And, and we, in the RFP, they did bring contractors in that were familiar with this. Because if you don't get a contractor that's familiar with it, we've heard a lot of horror stories of how it goes south and it goes south in that way. So, so two add-ons on the contracting side, you see it a lot in, in the mountain communities and much smaller developments, and that's because there is a price premium to, to the seasonal construction nature, and that's why that price premium is can be absorbed. But here on the front range, it's not as common because uh, the price premium is not, is they don't need to, to shorten the construction time frame so drastically to be able to do it. So that's one thing that we've learned. And then secondly, on the financing side, it's, it's lenders, um, but it's also Chaffa. They, if you're see, if they see you with a prefab model, they're like, well, we're not going to order, we're, we're not going to allocate <coughs> tax credits unless we know that you have the funding to uh, come up with that upfront fund. So it's like a chicken and egg. Oh yeah. Um, somebody's got to figure it out. And we we told this developer, if it can be figured out for the front range, we want to be the ones to do it. But we're also not going to risk the project horribly to do something that doesn't make sense. So we're still in that exploration phase, but um, what you do see here does reflect that hope. Um, so what we have is a set of townhome product prefab, townhome products here with tough under parking. This was, it was 28 units, if I recall, of three bedrooms. Um, so that's, we're trying to also, because it is a huge site, um, that would help make a more diverse neighborhood and have some place making and just have a mix of products. So if anybody on the front range can do it, we want to do it. Again, good copy nice. And then we have a more traditional multifamily that would be primarily one and two bedroom units. Um, and with those one bedrooms, we're really talking about, it's a family centric idea for this property. So um, making the one bedroom kind of plus where if there's a parent that has, you know, a child part-time, that there is a proper space. We're trying to think of all those types of things here because a um, one bedroom and a family property doesn't seem like it makes sense, but on the finance side, they almost need those one bedrooms to make it pan out. So this is just a concept. I mean, you see like what looks like a pool here. This is all to be, that's a, that's like a playground space or something in the middle and some surface parking and then some tough under parking as well. Um, that's the basic bird's eye view, but what we really wanted, and this is all concept and still being explored. 
But what we really wanted to go over tonight with you is the potential for community services that we could put into this multi-family building. So if you mind going down, might be one or two screens. That's just an overhead of what, that's the same thing that you see. Down one more. Again. Again. <laughs> It doesn't look like we're basically it's changing. Showing it's showing it's showing it's we're going into we see the is that all the it was like uh, maybe there are some showing up fully. So if you go up, try and go up to the top version of, of this one. Let's see if we can get a first floor. Oh, that was it. There we are. Oh, it was on here. I'm sorry. This is so light, it's hard to tell. So we have an opportunity here. So this is the first floor of that building where we still have units here on this side. Mm -hmm. And then we have an opportunity for some sort of community service space. And typically in a multi-unit residential, this would be amenities, it would be a community room, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, what we're hoping to accomplish with this um, family-centric property is um, bringing in some more unique community services. So we've been working with the community services divisions um, which are now Recreation Cultural Library um, and golf and golf group, um, children, youth, and families, etc. To see what we could do here, um, we if this was in a qualified census tract, which is our our more concentrated low income census tracts, then we would have the opportunity, most likely, to include community services in what's called basis, meaning the tax credits would fund it. This is not in a qualified census tract, even if we do have populations in this area that are that could use these services. Um, and so we couldn't necessarily get all of the community services covered in that basis. Maybe some we're trying to work that and be creative. But basically we have about 8,000 square feet to work with. And the top three um, items that have really come out as agreed upon between all of our community services divisions is a um, like a storefront library in somewhat of a retail space, but a, a library satellite, mm -hmm. either like a branch or maybe just a, a smaller you know, drop-in with computers and library vending machines. We're talking about all of the options there. And then potentially an early child care center that can serve the units above and then take overflow for elsewhere um, and then one other request is from all of the divisions was flex space to be able to do community programming in different ways and that got modified today so, <laughs> I wasn't that one either. Yeah. so by the way part of it is it when they were looking, when they were looking at flex space so when i was working this weekend i I was thinking about what we have at uh, Lashley Street Station, what we have at Isaac Walton, and how we're programming it. And, and so I talked to Joni and Jeff today, and I asked Jeff, I go, how often are we programming these other spaces? And, the, and Jeff's like, yeah, I'm finding we're not. And I said, so if we're not programming, shouldn't we program these other spaces to 100% before we look at more flex space? Jeff was like, yeah, I think that's what we need to do. I think we need to look at early childhood and the library and we'll see that was the, the thing that, that occurred today. Uh, when we talk about early childhood, basis is really important because we know from the library standpoint that because it's not in a QCT, we can't use basis on that. So if we were to do that, we would have to find that a way to fund that piece of it via city dollars, not included in that because it's not included in basis. If we were in a QCT, completely different conversation. Early childhood, we're starting to try to figure out is if we put early childhood in it, and if the priority for the early childhood care is for the residents, can that be included in basis? Um, because if, if the servant, if it's directed to the people that live there, you can include it. 
We don't know if we can make that argument, but we're going to try to make that argument to say something to the effect that it's early childhood space for the residents. If they don't fill all their spots, then they can open it up to the community. And our goal is to get that in places. But we could strike out and not get it. But so we're starting to talk to the early childhood providers. Uh, I know we've talked to Head Start as well because I know they need some space and we're getting some space requirements for them. And part of why we, the other reason I didn't, I, I personally wasn't really keen on the flex space is we want to activate that space. Mm -hmm. And if you have flex space, you don't necessarily keep it activated all the time. Mm -hmm. And I think that goes to safety and other things and more people you have there. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think the answer now is try to get a library of early childhood when we have I have a question on early childhood, uh, which I think is a great idea. Um, would that be third party operating that? No. Oh, great. Okay. It basically she's like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, a, like a retail <laughs> condominium <laughs> uh, okay. setup where, yeah. I did, because I think Carol just has too much to do. To <laughs> 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 that is their vision there. I had a hard enough time with my kids for that. Yeah. So, <laughs> so what, what this is showing right now is the max request for that satellite library, if it was the big version and not a smaller version, this is the 5,000 square foot set aside for the library. Mm -hmm. And then this is a 3,000 square foot that right now is showing flex. Um, but we could talk about how to manage early childhood in that or mm -hmm. split it in a different way. And we could try in the library to put some meeting space in there. Mm -hmm. And if you need the meeting space for the residents, then maybe you can get some of that in the basis. But mm -hmm. we've got a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. And funding will have to come up with it. We know that in some level, you would have to figure that out. But we wanted to um, get your feedback tonight on Moving further down that direction, if we're going the right way. So would that also be possible for say net cafe or um, say communal communal workspace for the residents that live? Because that's I think the caveat for all of this is it's yeah. the residents. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. It's like a almost like a business center. Uh, lab specifically for those residents. So you could be very creative and kids can with do, it. Right, kids can do, can do learning. remote learning or anything like right. that. Okay. Be, I mean, we can get, we're, we're trying to stretch our legs mm -hmm. as far as we can financially. Well, part of it is we're going to have to work with um, our LHA hat off, mm -hmm. city manager hat off. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to work with groups that provide these services to get creative because if you did a co-working space computer lab that was available for the residents and so you have resident services there that were jointly used with the library we're going to have to think of different models to do this well it seems like a very tight rope walk yeah. so the Oh, okay. oh, is is this library different, a different branch library than the one we're talking about? Smaller. Smaller, yes, but in addition to. Yes. Think of it, so libraries are using a lot of storefronts in commercial areas where you can do pickups, small computer labs, things like that. It's not a library in the traditional sense. Well, you might have some real children's books, but other than that, no. We've got to work on that because the basis question is going to be. It could be an order type system where you order the book and bring it and they squeeze and pick that. We already have that in our library, so it wouldn't be like, you know, it's easy. I mean, and it's a complicated equation because. When we think about this, one piece of it's a capital, but the other piece is the ongoing. Mm -hmm. And that's always the hardest for us to figure out. But Jeff's aware of this, and as they're refining the numbers, 
for the cultural and recreation acts. This is going to tie the Navy Ballistic in that end, which could be a road. The problem is this we're trying to shoot for August. August tax credits. August middle. tax credits, which they will also want to know what funding up. commitments we have lined up. Right. The last, I forgot to mention the total number of units here. So what this is showing currently in this model is um, 53 one, two, and three bedroom units in the in the building, and then 26 townhouses, so 79 units overall, which we could max out. I mean, we've seen there the, the process is to show the maximum yield of units on the site and then work your way down to something that actually works. The maximum yield on the site was like 174 units, and it was massive. Um, and this is trying to back into what is most successful in the LIHTC application. Like that's too big to be successful at one time. Yeah. So that's what we're. Well, we may have to go into two separate applications. Right. Which would, if we, if we think about it strategically, they go with half one first, we go with second, but they give us some time to figure out mm -hmm. other pieces. And we're looking at other grant funds as well. Yeah. So some of the town funds. And then Christina found some grants for the library and the early childhood that are pretty unique in the state that they grant that the So, so um, when you're talking about the, uh, I want to call it pre the with, uh, with the money up front, is it fallback provisions if they do not? Yeah, I mean, and there's a, what we're finding is actually they're one of the that are now showing themselves. Okay. There's some in Utah that are that they're looking at. Uh, yes, I'm liking somewhere, but they have a manufacturing facility in Nebraska. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they're looking Idaho. at all. Okay. Idaho is the. Idaho, you're right here. That's still there's a lot of detail there to be worked out too. We haven't fully delved into what that would actually look like coming from the prefab, whether. Mm -hmm. But they're going to Park City, the Park City doing something that they mentioned they're going to talk to you about. It's certainly the Idaho Company. Yeah. But, so I just wanted to mention that because you know we, we did want to maximize density as much as we could, but we also need to be realistic on what we could get funded. And when it comes to those three bedrooms, I mean we don't want to have too many three bedroom apartments just to to serve what the market would um, be able to fill, and the townhomes for those three bedrooms are make a lot of sense. So, so I guess a question for you all in terms of that space: um, Do you all agree that we should look at library and early childhood, or should we look at other? No, I think those two are the same. I think your arguments for not doing the other flex spaces is that. To Jeff's point, we would be to have either not using anything up to 100% to begin with. So, why just add another flex? Right. And some of this space might be flex in the sense that at some point in the day or evening, it might not be used and could be used in the event that it needed to. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Is that it? We'll keep moving. Uh, so the idea is we'll we're having some we're gonna have enough of a concept design and financial model to put in for a uh, grant application in March and I mean, we're, we're still figuring out which tax credit only makes the most sense, but we certainly have enough by spring to make some decisions. Mm -hmm. So Molly, on your very first slide, I thought that I saw two uh, right there, two places for the building. Is that correct? It's, it's just looking at it from the north south orientation. Okay. And yeah. But it is two parcels. I see it now. Yeah. That's one against the other. Mm -hmm. So this is, that's facing north, so okay. those parts don't lodge. Yeah. Okay. We can kind of get into just to give you a sense of some detail. Like, because of where Hearthstone and Lodge is placed, I asked them, well, can we rotate that one building? Still looks the same way. And and they said, no, you don't want your parking lot facing them, you want your parking lot facing the rear of the commercial. Mm -hmm. And so we're getting into pretty nitty gritty stuff. 
Also on this, this is the one where we're really talking to LPC in terms of solar, heat pumps, and different components on this, even to the point of well, where do you find battery storage because we're trying to maximize density. And so we had a good conversation about potentially utilizing some of the over property for battery storage. Um, and so a lot of that were pretty in depth in and all of these issues. I will say the one thing that we did say in terms of looking at site wise, site wide uh, geothermal or some version of that is we're, we're going to want whatever we use to be a closed system. Yeah. Meaning that we don't want air circulating from one unit into the broader properties because we all know the issues you get into. So one of the limiting factors in that is going to be whatever we do has to be a closed system where the air stays within the individual apartment units or we're going to buy a bigger problem for ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. So to that point, when uh, Glenn and I were on the meeting Friday, um, I asked them why why can't we give uh, rebates, and probably not tax credits, but rebates to developers to put in heat pumps or alternative heating systems instead of putting it on the backs of the residents. Because of the new development, if the developer could buy in bulk heat pumps or whatever and get a rebate on those, mm -hmm. so they're going to put it to the policy yeah. division. Karen, did you explain to me why we that? Are people facing commercial versus residential? What was the reason? Well, so this is, this is Cook Court here. This is eight, I'm sorry, this is 18. So having 18 be the main connector to Hover was good for the library and the early child care because people would be coming that way. Mm -hmm. And then on Cook Court is more of a street and you want it to look like a streetscape with the townhouse doors and stoops that, that, that uh, help neighbor to neighbor interactions and really all the ugly stuff where the cars are coming in and pulling into the parking lot, keep that facing the back of Walgreens. The other thing, and that's a private, that's just a private driveway, basically. Another road. Road. Yeah. Well, we're in that HOA, so. Because we're in HOA, too, by the way. The other you thing are? is. And <laughs> yeah, we talked about how we still pay HOA. The other thing is on street parking, to maximize on street parking for the library or the childhood versus having to park in the, in the parking lot, because that's just a lot of money for it. Space that you don't generate revenue. So. But this is like 10 designs down, and you're probably going to be in the 15. Okay. So. Can't wait. I mean, we're not going to have a pool. This is actually not a pool, it's a school. It's supposed to be like a, it was like, well, to do like a splash pad if you're going to do that. But generally, families focused, outdoor space. And then the other thing is, if we do an early child care center, are they able to use that, or is that too crossing the parking lot with little kids? So how do we fit that in? There's a lot of working pieces still. Okay. So uh, we are at the commissioner comments. Do I Commissioner comments is. Oh, where's the inner? Is it supposed to be it's next? Oh, oh, okay. Never mind. Go ahead. Well, I think nobody has a comment, so we're going to skip six and go right to uh, inner director. Sorry, that's one way before you go. Uh, a few things I want to talk about. First, is you know, we, we talked about meth fairly extensively in, in these meetings and what we need to do. Um, we um, have contacted the company out of um, New Zealand, and uh, we've had several meetings with them. We are entering into a, we are uh, approaching entering into, or actually either brief in terms of this, um, a test project where we get 50 meth detectors in. Um, <coughs> we can um, start testing to see how they work. Uh, based on the information we're getting 
Yeah, I've worked with news stories from Australia and other places. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're expanding. They just now received their FCC approvals to operate in the United States. But they're talking to various, I think predominantly, um, hotels right now. Um, they are talking to a couple of housing authorities. Um, we're on the front end of that. And so we're going to look at purchasing 50 of those. I think it's 25000 Dollars. We're trying to work through some technical pieces on that right now. Sarah's taking that, working with Valerie because um, they communicate via, via cellular technology, and it's from New Zealand. So we're having to figure out um, how we handle the SIM cards on this. Um, once we can figure that out, we will purchase the SIM cards here. We have to send them to New Zealand to be installed because the MEP detectors are camera proof. And so you can't install them here. And then we're going to work with them in terms of setting the levels that, that it gets in terms of MEP. Um, it was evaluated by the um, Southeast Asian Laboratory group. Um, it will pick back up to one part of the building. They're finding results where it will pick it up if you smoke it outside and walk by it. Mm. So when you look at the cost of remediation and what we're having to do, um, it's a big difference. And so we're going to bring it in. We're talking to them about a three-month test, evaluate it, maybe go another three months. But I know this is something you all have been pushing mm -hmm. us to do. And um, being pushed to do. Right. And so we're going to, once we can figure out the tech piece on this, Kendra, we're going to um, <laughs> Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> okay, so $25,000. <laughs> <laughs> so um, part of what I'm also thinking about doing is, is maybe holding 10 of those units and, and putting them in based on what we've seen recently, putting them in public facilities. Uh, and, and our students, they um, will communicate with us via app. So if somebody tries to tamper with it, it'll tell us. Um, it'll communicate the levels to us. Um, and and basically, we're just trying to stop pain. What's the, what should we pay for you? Well, there's two things. A, we don't want to lose our insurance. Because the insurance piece is probably concerning more than anything right now with the number of claims that we've been making with due to map and managing costs. But at the end of the day, it's about the health, safety, and welfare of all the residents that are living in these facilities mm -hmm. and making sure that they're safe. So. And we could equip every single one of our units and at the retail rate, not the negotiated rate, and it would still be equivalent to one reconstructed unit. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, people you know. Yeah. <laughs> the, That's the whole yeah. yeah. preventative measure, hopefully. But right. you would have a lot of vacancies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, yeah, we're going to be very overt. We're going to yeah. have an addendum to the crime free multi family housing piece on the lease. We're going to be upfront with folks where we're going to put them in initially on units that we can work and we may test some here or there, because it'll even pick it up late. And the way they're talking, the two months after we <coughs> uh, So we're going to be working with public safety. I don't know, Sarah, do you have anything to add to that? No, I was, well, a little bit. So, if, you know, looking into this a little bit more, um, talking to Michelle Goldman, our assistant chief fire marshal, um, and chief, chief Higgins, um, they just, in layman's terms, think of it operating like a CO2 unit. Mm -hmm. And the alarm does not go off to the, it, it's a silent alarm, basically, and it, it alerts oh, us. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, talking, we really need to be specific on placement of these if we're going to go outside of units mm -hmm. and what levels we, we want to keep them at because if you keep it at a very low, are very high, you know, we're going to get all these different variables and what, what, what outcomes are we looking for. So, hmm. 
Okay, I just have a question. I can't see. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so my question is, can you contrast this, which is like, again, like a, a, a CO2 detector or a CO detector or whatever, um, versus the, the testing that we do after a building is vacated? How does that work? I mean, that in terms of the speed and human effort to get it done and all of that. Um, and the reason I'm asking is because public are asking, uh, well, you know, all these other libraries are testing and they're finding that, but you're not testing our library that's up here. Separate question, I think there were cause in the other library systems <coughs> trying to inform, which is distinctly different. So uh, the other was cause in Boulder. I don't know about the other. I think there was there cause was, in the other. I, I heard of uh, the uh, CR, CER, no. they did a whole segment on yeah. there, and yeah. there was cause. And so, they don't have cause. And so, okay. so different I question. Am. What I would say from my standpoint is the sooner you catch it, the the, the lower the cost. Of the sure, of course. Mm -hmm. That's that's it. Obviously, yeah. prevention, but lower the cost. It's a cleaning versus one unit right now. That are they still trying to figure out what to take out of it? No, that one is. Well, we have the one that asked the most neighborhood that has a board on the front door. So we had to even take off the front door, all the window seals, everything. It is down to nothing. Down to rafters and studs. So you said you have to replace studs too. We were afraid we were going to. Well, I guess we did. We had to grind a garage for a unit to get the concrete clear. Wow. And Marcia, to answer your question a little bit more clear on the front end, um, mm -hmm. how how a lot of times apartment communities find out is traffic, and in the front group where they're in the you get to see calls for service, and so say you have. You know, a lot of these times people have people in and out all times of day, all times of night. Neighbors start to notice that it takes a lot longer for things to pop up versus the detector telling us, hey, this person, you know, literally eats inside or outside. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a faster way to find out if people are using versus mm -hmm. taking the time, okay, you know, Lisa hears that we might. We, we either have someone that police have seen activity, uh, we were paraphernalia or we made an arrest, etc. And then we go down the posting of the notice, or we have the post of notice, and we're kind of going over that matrix. Um, because we could have just a guest versus a leaseholder, and so it's a whole different yeah. problem. It's going to speed up the process. Yeah, I'm just just more asking what the process like now. So if you have established probable cause, you go in and like scrape, take paint scrapings and take it to your lab. Or what's it like? Yeah. What? Um, so we have cause, and we just start serving the notice. Like if they told the police, like we did in our calls for service, that they were smoking meth. We've had that happen where people commit to the police. They've done meth, so then we start the notice of the ten day. And then we have to go through the whole court process before we can get in there and test the unit. Yes, I'm, so, and I, and I understand that there's, yeah. a, there, there's a legal process. I'm asking about the clinical process. So you've got these new fancy detectors. How do the old detectors do? Oh. There's, 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 there's no one. There's no one. No. A certain way my genus goes in for my police cycle is the most common company that, that I mean, properties here in Long Island, is they go in. Test it. They send it to the state. State then the test. The test. What does the test do? It basically, you test different areas on the wall, and then you have to send it to a certified lab. Yes, and that's then, what I'm trying to ask. Then, you take cake scrapings or material scrapings. Can they do about forty fifty swabs? There you go. Swabs. Okay. Yeah. That's what I was asking. And you would still have to go through the process. Sure. So that doesn't the process. well, even if this went off, you would still have to go through that process under state law because that is what creates. Sure, the but if it goes off then you know that you can stop the contamination process and if it didn't go off, you know you don't have to do that. And let me be clear, this is civil. Everything we're talking about is civil. It is, has nothing to do with criminal. This is as landlords for having Exactly. 
Uh, sure. Commissioner LaPlay. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, what I was thinking about it when you were talking about this, and you started to touch on it at the very end there uh, with uh, what uh, Commissioner Martin was uh, asking, was the issue around somebody who comes in that you, you said that these things are pretty uh, 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 sensitive. sensitive to being able to pick up. So, individual A out here isn't part of the unit, smokes it. Individual B walks through the cloud or whatever. Individual uh, comes and visits individual C who owns the uh, or is renting the, the apartment, and all of a sudden it goes off. Neither one of B or C have smoked meth. Do we have camera systems in there showing, you know, who's coming in where and on the outside because you know. We wouldn't want to start accusing people of Right, and, yeah. and you just, I mean, exactly. So we'll use the suites as an example. The camera system inside the hallway is great, right? So we'll be able to say, oh, well, so-and-so came in at this time. I mean, there's going to be a lot more, I mean, those little things that we need to really talk about are, are going to have to be, like, we're going to have to have, have yeah. to have an operating process for that. Right. Yeah, and as Tim reiterated, we need a policy, so... Yeah, I would think so, part because of, you're starting to <laughs> step into people's personal lives and behind closed doors and that type of stuff. Yeah, so um, we did have a conversation with Tim and another under fair housing, and, and so we need a process in that. We have asked to, and they have, uh, New Zealand and Australia aren't that different from how we operate, and so we ask for the processes that they have, and to set up a meeting with owners that have utilized this, so that we can really get that set. And obviously, we won't do anything until we have all of that. We just want to let you know we're in the process of finalizing it, and uh, it's interesting. Um, we know that the other one that we're talking to is in Denver, um, and every other person that is touching housing right now has said let us know how this works um, because we're all at a crisis point uh, we're fortunate we still have insurance um if we lose insurance and we have to do two of these we would be bankrupt probably yeah, yeah. It's, it's about a hundred thousand dollars we have a hundred thousand dollar cap on our insurance so if anybody goes above that it's out of our pocket and it has a five thousand dollar but the last one see the demolitions or costs to the, um, because usually most of them are going to go through the eviction process. It's been most of the time. So, um, the good news is there is some technology out there that we think can help us. Another thing I wanted to talk to you all about is really the two buildings that we own. So, we have talked with the, the, the board about the CPWD building and selling that building to the Center for People with Disabilities. They're releasing that now. Uh, they were interested in purchasing it. And so, uh, that's the building that's adjacent to Village Place. Uh, we did extend the contract um, for three months um, and we're now going to engage in conversations to sell that building to them. That is um, pretty important for our cash flows and we're looking at certain issues. Um, early on, we also have talked about um, what are we going to do with the office building um, that LHJ used to be in for we have the Briarwood Apartments. Um, I have reached out to DCP, they're listening to us there to see if they're interested in buying it. I think that makes a lot of sense because they can utilize their units in a similar fashion. They have indicated that they want to begin conversations on that. And again, I think the cash flows make a lot of sense. At Briar River, we're only talking 10 units. We're bringing online in the next two to three years at least 221 uh, units. And so we need to start that conversation for planning, but I wanted to make sure you all knew what we were doing it and to see if you all agreed with us taking that approach. Okay. And then we're still working. So on the other side of it, on the Housing Authority side, we also do LHDC work. It's primarily audits now. 
Um, we are still working on transferring the LHTC over to the Housing Authority. Um, Chrisman Walk 2 was the model. Don't worry. Did we do Chrisman 1 or no? That's Chrisman 1, Spring Creek, and Fall River are the next ones up because they're right. the, the least heavy lift. And Village Place is going to happen automatically with this location. Right. So then we're really left with um, our stone and lodge. And that's the one that's a HUD 2 of two property, which is a little more complicated, probably going to take more time. Uh, the good news is the, um, the, uh, the LHTC board is willing to hang on with this, uh, through this. And so the, the imminent uh, legal stop has changed. And so that's good news that they're working with this. And actually getting excited about some of the projects and trying to figure out how can they participate in that. But, um, that's all I have. Sarah, do you have any safety issues? To um, no, not necessarily. Any questions about any specific? Oh, snow. Yeah, forgive him. <laughs> so, as Kinder was closing the year out, we realized that we paid 200 almost $200,000 in snow removal for the LHA properties. Um, we started, I said, what are we doing? Um, we have begun conversations uh, with cash on the city side to see what it would take to purchase at least one truck and one of the little, you see our oranges that we have with their cover. Um, and so we're working through those numbers now because it appears that we can at least we can get what we say two trucks and one of those and a trailer and the team and these the ones we would we would actually buy from the city would be somewhere in the neighborhood of one hundred and fifty thousand. I think they're still working with numbers. Is that what it was, Kinder? One hundred and fifty with cash is option. I, I came into the conversation late, oh, so, so I don't even I mean, know what the decision was as far well, as the so, trailer. Yeah. <laughs> so we think it's about we think it's about one hundred fifty thousand, which um, on a one time cost on a yearly basis, we we've got to figure out how we're going to handle it in the budget. But when you look at the ongoing cost, that really kind of applies to the units. It, it will be significantly lower on an ongoing basis, mm -hmm. and so and then our our maintenance staff would be doing that, which what we're finding is they're having to go out and do some of it now because it's just snow contractors or everything they're just being taxed. So we may very well come back within a month to you all with some budget adjustments that we're gonna need to, to acquire this equipment. We will probably have to have an agreement. So you know how I've drawn hard lines on this. Jim will be the one on the city side that will be working it. We'll be working it over here, but we may have to work some arrangement where we do it over time so that it doesn't tax us financially in one fell swoop. Uh, but we think that's the best way to do it. We actually think we'll get quicker snow removal on the properties and then save ourselves a lot of money on a basis. Do you have a contract with the snow removal company? Yes. Yeah, is 30 day notice. So, and you know, the last few storms, even my HOA was sending out notices going, we're not sure the snow's going to be removed because they're just worn out. Mm -hmm. Just because of the amount of snowballs we've had and how much. And um, so, yeah, we're working through all that. I just wanted to give you a heads up because if we do it, we're going to want to do it sooner rather than later so we don't keep paying bills. And how bad is January? Right, I thought you were going to last month. And we didn't even get this last month. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm so out of it. How, how many snow events were behind that? Did you see there were two snow events? Oh, you saw three. And one of the trailer, but we'll, we'll work with Cash on the numbers and what he's looking at. And he's the expert. And we can work with Jim on that. But, uh, We've got to do something we can't continue doing this. There's a bleed of gash. Does that fit the numbers? Okay. So, are we done then? Can I have a motion to return? I think we've got uh, update operations, just the, the occupancy. So, 
<laughs> we did end the year at um, a 93% occupancy, which um, had a lot to do with audits, inspections, holidays, weather, everything. It was hard to fill units um, those last two months of the year due to a number of issues. Um, but my team is coming back strong. We've already had quite a few move-ins already this year. Um, our highest number of vacancies is obviously the suites. We're sitting at 14 right now. This reflects 13, but we are up to 14 vacants. How many of those are MHP? Um, the 13 showing on here, seven were MHP, six were LAJ, and LAJ I think has four working right now to be moved in in the next couple of weeks. Um, and are those ready for occupancy? The empty ones or are they? They're all different stages. Some are. Um, we've had two of the down units um, previously reported 7110, which was a meth unit at the suites. That one's already occupied. And then 7114, which was another meth unit and was showing on here in process of reconstruction. That one actually has a movement scheduled next week. So these units are coming back online pretty quickly now and being occupied. Right now we have three waitlists open and we are um, it's working through the old waitlist still in the other properties and once those are extinguished, we're gonna just keep the waitlist open I think year round now so that they don't go stagnant and that we always have good names. Because what we're finding is when one person applies to one waitlist, they're applying to every waitlist open. So um, we may have 50 people on, on every waitlist, but 20 of those names are all duplicate. So if they move into one property, we just lost 20 names. And we're still calling them, you know, hey, are you looking to move in? Not knowing that they did move they in. Move in. Oh. But we've also, what we're moving to is um, a new process for the waitlist where the admin assistant is going to manage the waitlist. So she'll be able to see, oh, this person moved in and take them off of all the other waitlists. Oh, so okay. one person going forward will be managing all those waitlists mm -hmm. for us. And so you know where we're having the biggest problems in our age restricted problems. Mm -hmm. It's been yeah. Difficult filling. Um, people are now moving in with their kids, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. we're hoping moving closer to spring that we'll have more people wanting to be on their own again and be able to fill because they're not constricted with the weather. Nobody wants to move in this weather. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's yeah. one thing we're hearing. Yeah. I'm not moving. I'm not moving right now. So. We don't want to look at it. You haven't screwed with snow. Yeah. <laughs> Without counting the suites right now, my properties are sitting, I think we ended this month at a 95 or 96 percent occupied when you would take the suites out. So, mm. so the suites waiting list is managed by the HCD staff. Oh, yeah. Housing oh, choice option, because all of those are project based. Mm -hmm. um, and we're we're going through it really quick because you know the majority of the people that are on the list are, are homeless. So you might have to send out 30 letters to get one person to identify. Mm -hmm. So, an MHP is yeah, running into the same difficulties. They said they can send out 20 letters and not even get a response for a unit. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're planning on we're planning on um, opening up the waiting list in every six months. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of get rid of it and then open it up. So, so um, do you let the Ellen Center and know about the okay, yes. oh, we have a mass list that gets emailed all resource centers here in Longmont. Every um, case, many case managers are on that list for agencies, so it, and it gets publicized as well. Okay. Well, I think Tracy made a good point. When you, when you talk about government supported, when we're talking about unhoused solutions, uh, the Swedes and Zinni that we can look at both of them being permanent supported. There's a strong connection to the unhoused and open house solutions. So when we talk about we're bringing 55 units on for Zenia, that's a lot. You know, there's units there for the unhoused and to work through that process. And uh, one of the things we've talked about is working with folks about being housing ready. It's a different conversation we do regarding. There's different thresholds and we're finding that at times they're not. And we end up getting into some pretty bad situations and then having to move to the insurance. So those are things that are on our mind trying to figure out how do you really get someone ready to move in and where they need to go. Um, and that's not unique to us. Everybody that's in permanent support is 
same thing. Mm -hmm. I'll move on to the, um, just the property updates. Not a lot for December, but the VIA shuttle transportation is increasing. We see numbers double at Spring Creek, Aspen, and Village Place. Those residents, now that they've seen a few go, the numbers are up to nine, 10 residents per trip. Um, LHA did some urine bingo bashes at all the properties, which was a big hit. Um, we solicited um, all the LDDA properties, asking them for donations, gift cards, stuff like that, and went to each property and did a two hour bingo session with the prizes, and they just loved it. So it's a great way to end the year with the residents. We have a 4% rental rate increase for the communities, and the feedback from the residents was actually not bad. They Carol went out and explained it to them all and why we needed to do it, and I been very little upset, so. Um, suites, our calls for service from public safety is remaining low, and we've had quite a few days with no calls recently. So Yay. for the last month, I think we've had, what, three, four days since with no calls, so. <laughs> <laughs> so not so cool. old. Yeah. <laughs> um, the suites we also have hired one of our three building attendants so our weeknight building attendant did start two weeks ago he's this is his third week and he patrols um 7 30 to 5 30 in the morning and so he takes over all the lockout calls um walks the grounds multiple times a night he's helping maintenance with um, cleaning units painting whatever he can do cleaning the common area so it's a win-win this is um what replaced the security company that used to be there. And I'm making a second offer tomorrow for our one. Um, two meth units and one biohazard, and then we have a leak unit, so that was on the down units that we're working through insurance claims on to get those units back online within the next 30 to 60 days. What would constitute a biohazard? Oh my <laughs> God. <laughs> <laughs> That's one experience that one. <laughs> <laughs> Worse, yeah. Um, let's just say they need it gets it gets pretty personal. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, they had to cut out two feet of drywall. Oh, bio. <laughs> Throughout the whole unit, two feet of drywall. Oh, one of those situations where assisted living. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Um, Aspen Meadows, we're still working on the flooring unit um, from the remodel and um, resyndication. We're working on our next steps with that. Neighborhood, um, we did have a great Chapa inspection. They came out to the Chapa um, inspected 10 units. They were really pleased with the turnaround of the property and where everything looked. They also inspected Aspen Senior, which we were not expecting, but had very little comments and was pleased with how management was handling everything, how the units looked inside. The files looked so great to wrap and check with Kappa. So touched on that. And then our village place for syndication, we're really kicking it off. We met with the architect and the residents on Monday. Got a lot of great feedback from the residents for what they want to see with this re syndication. It, it was a listening session to intake rather than put out what's going to happen. So this architect is really good at working. Um, Spring Creek and Fall River, um, we do have a vacant manager position. So Corinne, who does the Aspens and the Suites, is temporarily taking over Spring Creek. And then Andre, who does the Hearts and the Lodge, is temporarily taking over Fall River. I am making an offer for a manager tomorrow for that property. So we will have that vacancy hopefully filled here in the next two weeks. Um, Hearts and the Lodge both had their MOR audits. And we we'll have some MOR audits. Um, okay. <laughs> It's, it's a HUD audit related to their multifamily program. File review. That was the one that I told you where they failed it miserably. Right. And then we did really well. Yeah, so we got the official results in December. Mm -hmm. And then the lodge, the bed bug um, issue is no more. So that's mm -hmm. been taken care of. Yeah, that's, that's it. LHA in December in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> any questions on anything going on in the properties? I'm just amazed at what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
you know, this is two audits almost a month, right? Two to three audits a month and inspections. We had one on Monday, one last week, two the week before. So for yes, all the units. Some of the units have five different sources of funding. And you know, they, they might have home and housing tax credits and housing and voucher and grants and vouchers. Oh, yeah, so, yeah. and then management on top of it enters the unit to do our annual inspections, um, which will be twice a year going forward. So, yeah, these units. <laughs> it inspected. Yes. Two. You have that many external inspections every month? Or is this like because it's. Standard. It's pretty standard because of the type of housing we have. So, you got to think each investor wants to come and look at their asset. Then anybody who put money into the property wants to come look at the asset to make sure you're maintaining it. Um, so yeah, some of these units, properties can have five, six inspections in a year. Mm -hmm. And then we have nine properties. <laughs> so I do have a question, um, you know, with the uh, net units, I'm counting the ones that are down, and then the length of days mm -hmm. um, vacant. Mm -hmm. um, do you find that this time's going up, is, is it going up? The number that you're noticing of the turnaround time is actually going down now okay um, we've been able to have our adjuster work with some construction companies uh -huh. where we are now once we get the clearance from the county that the unit is decontaminated we're okay. scheduling our adjuster to walk with the construction companies okay. so that they're communicating at the same time instead of doing that back and forth which used to happen i found out that that's streamlining the process for us and it's and in the turnaround time. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. As soon as I get the bid, I send it back to the adjuster. He's like, I've already talked to them. I'm okay with this. Go ahead, sign it, and get the work done. Yes. Okay. So instead of the adjuster and the contractor having to go back and forth for a two to two weeks to six weeks of okay. you know pricing. Because I was looking at you know 229, 249 days. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Is that typical? Is that some of these, yeah, so like 114, that was um, one of the ones that had to be taken down to the studs. Mm -hmm. And then that was with the supply chain issues, um, not being okay, able to get yeah. stuff in. Sure. Um, and 305, that, that was a lot of, that was because that unit was part of the resyndication at Aspen Meadows and the flooring issues that we were trying to work through with the adjuster and how to okay. go about fixing that unit. Okay. But Fall River's down, um, yeah. we're at 121 days with the adjuster and the contractor have already come to an agreement. Mm -hmm. So now yeah. we're just waiting for them to get in there and start the work. So then that 100 number is about yes. more So average. I'm hoping to keep them right around. We want to see them done in 180 days now. Okay. So. Okay. Um, and then are you finding that, you know, are you coming across more units that are being contaminated with meth, or is it just kind of the same? It's about the same. It, it's about, okay. If it is, it's because we're just paying more attention. Um, okay. Well, that, that We don't think that, thing. Yeah. We, we can't tell if use is it's going, not, up, it's going but up, but... We don't ignore it when we get, and now we, we know what signs yeah. to look for. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say it's more related to our attention. Okay. I mean, so we, we went into one eviction that was one of the bad ones, which is stuff. Mm -hmm. Never assumed that was going to be an issue. Mm -hmm. And then they found it. Okay. And so I don't think our numbers are. I mean, when you talk to everybody that's in the rental world, it's mm -hmm. just a, it's a national crisis. Yeah. And so I don't know that we're any different. Um, I do think we are paying probably closer attention yeah, than, talking most, about it. Than, yeah. most, than most landlords. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting world. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay. Got it? I'll answer your question later. What is my Oh, no, that's all right. That's okay. I kind of I did some inferencing. <laughs> so, can I have a motion to adjourn? I will adjourn. Second. 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 Pete, are you in favor of adjourning? <laughs> yeah, I can't see anybody. So oh, oh, okay. Go ahead. In whatever. I'm ready. <laughs> 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 Thank oh, you. I see it's our camera.